All right, so um, yeah, we, let me start. So this is B21. My name is Artur Ismailov, and uh, I'll be teaching this course. So the course, the short outline, uh, is here, very pictorial. And um, the main idea here is that we will start with some basic formalism. I'll tell you a few experiments that uh, made people believe or made people invent quantum mechanics and then believe in its validness. And this, those experiments will show that actually the classical mechanics or classical physics in general uh, is not enough to understand some of the natural phenomena, like a double slit experiment that we'll consider today. So we start with the formalism, Schrodinger equation. We will show how it all works on a very simple systems, not even realistic simple uh, systems like, uh, the, like mathematical essentially systems for which we can solve time independent, time dependent Schrodinger equations. And then from these simple systems, the idea is that uh, they are useful because you can go and apply the same formalism, the same ideas, extend them to molecule, to atoms, and then to molecules, and then understand how the, say, spectroscopy works. Like you probably have taken some inorganic chemistry or organic chemistry where you uh, got yourself familiar with the spectroscopic methods, right? So how to identify the compounds like NMR, uh, IR, Raman spectroscopy. So that all can be understood uh, in the framework of quantum mechanics, right? But these later parts, uh, they are more advanced and we probably will not get to them. The idea of spectroscopy, of course, will be touched, but uh, we will not go into the details of these more advanced topics. And that's uh, more the subject of the next courses, like the C-level courses. I teach also C20 and C21. That's where I speak mostly about molecules and spectroscopy in details, okay? And methods, how do we extend the Schrodinger equation, the basic equation of quantum mechanics to those systems, uh, those phenomena. Now, now, quantum world is uh, mysterious, difficult to understand, uh, but as I said, math helps a lot. And there are some few quotes, essentially. I like to put, usually, this Niels Bohr and Richard Feynman. Those are the people who were at the beginning of quantum mechanics. And so one said that anyone who is not shocked by quantum theory has not understood it. And the second one said that, that I can safely say that nobody understands quantum mechanics. Okay? So the bottom line, we are up for an adventure here. Now, just to explain a little bit what I think they meant by understanding and why, why quantum mechanics seems so mysterious for people. Because the word understanding is usually mean that we compare what you are given as like an amount of, like some information, lecture, or you encounter some phenomenon. When well, you say you understand it, if you can kind of uh, draw some knowledge from the previous experience, okay? And all our experience is classical, essentially. We live in a classical world. We don't have microscope or like any advanced de uh, uh, kind of apparatus attached to our eyes, so we don't see things the way they are. We, th we see things in a, in a very classical way, right? So we only can perceive macroscopic bodies, whether it's bottle, table, or chair, right? Or car, or baseball. All those things are macroscopic, and quantum mechanics is uh, working for them too, but it can be easily explained uh, without quantum mechanics. Essentially, quantum mechanics is just too computationally advanced, too uh, theoretically advanced, uh, and you don't even need it for understanding classical world. So that's why your experience is mostly classical, and when we go to the quantum world, there is no match to your experience, essentially. That's why people say it's, it's impossible to understand. It's simply because you don't have any experience uh, to relate this phenomena to, right? And so don't be kind of discouraged by those statements. <laughs> the second one is actually quite positive, that uh, 
You don't understand quantum mechanics. I don't understand quantum mechanics. No one understands quantum mechanics. Even Richard Feynman, who got the Nobel Prize. But <laughs> I guess the idea of this course will be that uh, you will be more aware of your misunderstanding. Okay, so <laughs> and you can go and spread it. Uh, another thing is that more you talk about this phenomenon, more you work with them, on them kind of on a paper and pencil basis or doing the computer work, uh, that actually helps to kind of gain the experience and kind of breaking that uh, wall of, uh, and maybe eventually saying that, yeah, yeah I, kind of, I kind of start getting the uh, quantum mechanics. That's, that's more than enough to actually pass this course. But uh, yeah, the, the bottom line also here is that uh, you wanna expose yourself to this phenomenon, to quantum mechanics, quantum world as much as possible through homeworks and other things. We will do that together, right? Now, Albert Einstein is another guy who didn't like quantum mechanics. Uh, or he said that it's either incomplete, incorrect, or both. And uh, quantum mechanics is certainly imposing, but an inner voice tells me that it's not yet the real thing. So he was all like, just to to be fair, you probably if you look look up. Albert Einstein relation with quantum mechanics, you will see that he, yeah, he never accepted it. But uh, to, to understand his relation more, I could give you an analogy that uh, he actually understood quantum mechanics in the sense that uh, he understood it probably better than you will at the end of this course. So his relation was like more like when you understand the joke, but you don't, just don't consider it funny. Okay, so you understand why it can be considered funny for other people, but you just didn't like it. So he personally had a different standard, and quantum theory didn't satisfy that standard. Because as we will learn, in quantum mechanics, uh, not all the questions can be answered with certainty. Like, say, if uh, to give you an example, uh, if you ask me whether this uh, cup, uh, this coffee cup, stands on this table, uh, the answer is obvious. We can all see it, that it's, yes, it, it stands on this table, not on that table, right? But in, when we go to the microsc microscopic world, uh, some of the questions we can ask, we can possibly ask in an uh, analogous to the question about cup, but now questions about electrons, say, or small objects, then they cannot be answered with the certainty. Okay, so you can, like, if it's a quantum cup, very, very tiny, on a very, very tiny molecule or a table or benzene, like a shape of a table, right? Uh, you can think of that, right? And if you ask whether this electron is actually on this benzene molecule or on that naphthalene molecule, uh, sometimes uh, the answer is uh, you need to do measurement, and measurement can give you 50% times here, 50% times there. That was the part that Albert Einstein called, like, he doesn't believe that God throws dice, that's how he describes that situation where you measure the same identical system and you get different results. Okay, so he was not satisfied with that kind of theory. But to be fair, this theory actually works and uh, in quantum, chem like it's, it's uh, applicable to chemistry, to all. it's just the questions that we can ask are not all possible questions like in the classical mechanics. And we will see uh, what do I mean uh, later, more in details. But this is the useful theory. Uh, there were three Nobel Prizes given in chemistry for quantum related uh, you know, kind of frameworks that developed. First was uh, to Erwin Schrodinger, who came up with his famous Schrodinger equation in 1933. Uh, and also, it was split between Schrodinger and Dirac. Dirac was the author of the famous phrase, uh, which is pretty long, but the, the bottom line here is that, okay, the equation, Schrodinger equation, is a very powerful one, and it's essentially applicable to any molecule. You come up with a molecule, and I can write you down the Schrodinger equation, right? So now the difficulty is how to solve it, okay? It's like the analogy would be with the classical world, uh, Newton equations, right? So Newton equation of motion gives you essentially the prediction 
how things are moving under the certain like under known forces, right? So if I say I throw uh, some baseball with a certain uh, force with initial velocity, initial position, we're solving this Newton equation, you can definitely tell me whether I get with my baseball in this window where the well, like where I need to get it, right? But the same thing with the Schrodinger equation is just about a microscopic uh, object, right? Newton equation doesn't work in a microscopic world. Uh, Schrodinger equation works, okay? Now the trouble is that how to solve this equation, and that's the that's the main challenge, okay? Because we will see, you will learn how to solve it, but only for relatively simple systems, not for molecules like benzene. And that's where uh, the next advance came in 1998. Another Nobel Prize was given to two men, Kohn, Walter Kohn, and John Popple, for development of the computational techniques. Because the equation was formulated in the beginning of 20th century, but only at the end of the 20th century, uh, actually, field was developed so that this equation could be solved approximately still, but with a certain accuracy that was uh, enough to predict things with a chemical accuracy, right? So what is chemical accuracy? Do we kind of have a few? What am I talking about? Chemical accuracy in terms of energy. So that's kcal per mole, right? So about kcal per mole, that's the chemical accuracy. And you want to obtain, say, energies of uh, particles or energies of molecule states. Uh, at the kcal level, because you can do drastic approximations and then get some answers, but they're not going to be accurate. So what's the use in that? So these two men developed the powerful computational techniques that uh, allow you to obtain kcal per mole accuracy for and predict, say, vibrations of molecules, the spectrum, say, IR spectrum. Now, you don't really need to go and uh, do the experiment, on a spectroscopy experiment on the molecules like that, you can simply uh, put, it, put the structure in the computer and calculate, okay, and get the spectrum. Now, of course, the accuracy is still an issue. Depending on the molecule, the accuracy can be better or worse. And uh, the real situation right now is still that, uh, well, sometimes there are significant discrepancies. But the computational methods, what they uh, are good at is, say, if you have a vibration in a certain region, say this one, right, in the computational world, you can put the structure in the computer and tell exactly what is the motion of the molecule that is responsible to that, uh, to that peak, say this one or that one, right? Because you've probably seen in uh, uh, organic chemistry, they have these tables that CO group has the IR peak in, like, say, 15 uh, hundred, right, and or fourteen hundred, and then depending on what is surroundings of CO group, carb uh, carbonyl group, then the the frequency could be slightly higher or slightly lower, right? Now the computations allow you to tell what exactly that peak corresponds to, what motion, whether it's carbonyl or something similar to it, right? So that that allows to get some further insight. That's the main idea here. Also, uh, this method uh, actually could be extended to s surfaces, cat catalysts, uh, and uh, also the proteins. And actually, since the biochemistry is really on the rise these days, the next Nobel Prize was given to application of quantum chemistry to proteins. And those three men, uh, they were well, these two actually worked with for the Martin Karpulos at Harvard. And so they all developed so-called quantum mechanics, molecular mechanics techniques, where essentially the important physics uh, of the protein is usually uh, confined to a relatively small piece of the protein. And that's where you want to use quantum mechanics. But then for the rest of the protein, because quantum mechanics is difficult to, or equations are difficult to solve, then this man found the way to how to kind of combine the quantum mechanics with a uh, computationally cheaper version, classical mechanics. And that's the MM part, molecular mechanics. That's, uh, that's where we don't treat uh, nuclei, say, quantum mechanically. They are treated classically, and that's uh, allowed you to uh, kind of save computationally. 
and still treat large systems like proteins. And these days, well, this, for example, this molecule, it's a protein, and that's the real reason you can all see me today. I, not maybe all of you guys, but uh, well, most of you can see me, uh, because this molecule is a uh, rhodopsin. It's a protein, and we all have it in our eyes. So the way it works, when light comes, rhodopsin does some transformations under the like uh, expo uh, exposition to light and then it starts the vision process essentially right so it's a complicated process but these days things like that can be simulated on a computer this is not exactly rhodopsin but some other protein where this part of the, mo uh, of the protein is absorbs light because it has all these unsaturated bonds. Now the color change, that's, that's when the electrons are in a different state. It's like that, the excited state. And then they come back to the ground state and all that energy is now is distributed over the well, nuclear degrees of freedom. All these nuclei start to move and potentially can actually lead to reaction or, or some transformations that like in the adoption case, there is isomerization going on because light got absorbed, you got some energy, and energy, as you know, from B20 cannot be destroyed. It just redistributes between the different degrees of freedom. And here, the electrons absorb energy first and then give it to nuclei. Nuclei start moving, and that's what drives chemistry, essentially, right? So things like that now can be studied on a computer. And uh, I'm not saying that this course will teach you how to do that for molecules as big as this, but at least you will understand what's the, like, a, how does it all start, okay? So that's the idea here, because it just would be too much material to give in one course. And these are still state-of-the-art calculations, right? So it's a frontiers of research these days. But we can, we kind of, we're in a position with quantum mechanics now to, to do things like that, to model and to understand how the proteins work. Yeah. Our theories are based on observation for the most part, like from my understanding. Uh -huh. And when we apply like a computational model, how, how connected is what we observe empirically mm -hmm. Yeah, very good question. Uh, right, so you will see in this course, we'll start with some uh, simple experiments that uh, made people to believe that the previous theory is an inadequate in, the, in a certain context. So, so whatever theory we are considering, or whatever computations we do, uh, we usually have some outcomes of these simulations. Like in this case, for example, this, mo uh, this uh, group was moving one way or another, right? And if you can then experimentally probe and see that it's indeed happening that way, so you have certain uh, experimental references, right? So by those experimental references, you can check your theory, and that's how it works, because uh, one big misconception about the whole, like, and education actually makes it even worse because the way this course and many other courses are just organized, I'll give you the exposition of uh, knowledge that is already obtained, right? And you will think that, okay, scientists are people in lab coats who come every day, sit and, like, write set new set of truths, essentially. But that's not how it happens. If you ever watched the... Uh, TV series uh, House, for example, right? So that's how it's more, it's more realistic because one of the biggest drama there is that the patient, it's about doctors, right? So patient always concerned about their health and why wouldn't they be, right? And then they ask uh, doctors, like, what's wrong with me? Because there are only difficult cases considered in this uh, TV series. And doctors, <laughs> to the very frequently they say they just I don't know that's that's the answer that's the true answer and the scientists are the same they like we have an experiments to explain and it takes sometimes years and more than one year and the the if you ask in any intermediate point what's going on the the true answer is we don't know well like the science is the enterprise is not about knowing everything it's this it's like it's this magical process of how to go from not knowing to knowing, 
That's what doctors and scientists are good at. They are not good at knowing stuff. They are good at going from not knowing to knowing. That's, that's the very important truth. But education doesn't present it very well. Because in education, we all go to the textbooks and we all confuse, uh, like, it's just a misrepresentation of what's actually happening. Uh, we, we are studying, of course, some basic truths which are important to understand the material, to be on the front, uh, frontiers of science. Uh, but to answer your question, yeah, we, we kind of trying to always build the theory more accurately describing the, the experiments, but theory itself, once we make sure that our theory is describing all known experiments, we consider that is, it's an adequate theory. Now, theory can drive experiment. Not experiments drive theory, but theory now is self-sufficient and it can say, all right, if we do this, this should happen, actually. Or this type of advances, like if you, if you want to improve this protein and theory gives you very detailed knowledge how the protein works, you say, okay, so it seems like the, the protein will work faster if you substitute this group to something else. You try it in theory, theory confirms your hunch. Right? And then you go and do the experiment and all of a sudden it, uh, it turns out that you are right. You, you came up with a better protein or better drug, right? And so, of course, if you just mindlessly do the experiment in the lab, it may take you like lots of millions of dollars to actually on reagents and a lot of your time to come up with the same idea. That's, that's the value of the theory here. But you're right that theory initially at least is not self-sufficient. It always, it's kind of a theory and experiment always go in a balance, uh, in, a, in a harmony, and uh, one helps another, and another helps the, the first one. Uh, so it's like a circle, in a sense. That's how it works. All right. So, any more questions so far? Because uh, this is kind of a more flashy introductory part, and uh, the next thing I want to go over is syllabus. So just to explain you some of the basic things about this course, how you're going to be graded, who TA is going to be, that sort of stuff. Any questions on the quantum stuff so far? You will have plenty of time to ask more. All right, so let's start with syllabus. So syllabus is on the Blackboard uh, page of this course, All right? So I encourage you to read it. That's, uh, useful piece of um, information. Now lectures will be Monday and Wednesday. Monday this audience and uh, Wednesday will be downstairs I guess uh, just uh, two floors uh, below. And uh, there's a web option but I strongly recommend attending lectures for a well, few reasons here that you can ask questions and I will try to, my best to answer them. There will be I Genuinely, like the general situation, of course, you don't ask questions. And <laughs> I think that more you ask or more curious you about the subject is better for you. So I try to stimulate you asking questions. So there will be bonus points for asking questions for people who, are, who don't feel um, particularly predisposed to ask questions. I'm kind of creating a little bit of bias to, for them to ask still questions. And then um, third, participate in discussions, talking about quantum mechanics help. More you exposed, more experience you get, right? So that's my reasons to come to lectures. Uh, another thing, office hours. Also encourage you to come for office hours. And don't uh, be discouraged uh, from the fact that it's just one day and a uh, certain period. You can write me email. And uh, I'll make an appointment, and I'll try to make time for you. Again, the reasons to come, you can ask questions. There will be bonus points for asking questions at <laughs> office hours and participating in discussions. Pretty much the same thing. Now, recommend, uh, recommended texts. Uh, there are these three books. This one you may have from the B20. Uh, this one has a kind of a subsection which uh, made to a new book by Thomas Engel. So Thomas Engel is the author of uh, both of these uh, books. 
And this is kind of a more modern exposition. I like these books because they have nice pictures. Uh, the downside of these books, they are somewhat wordy and uh, like just uh, it seemed to me that uh, things could be explained uh, simpler and uh, with fewer words. And there are of course some mistakes, but well, everyone makes mistakes when, when they do something, right? So <laughs> it's not the biggest problem with books. And also it's good to have mistakes in the books because that shows how, well, what the reality is like. I, I remember well, one of my best lecturers in, uh, when I was undergraduate, he sometimes made mistakes and it kind of uh, kept us uh, interested in order to, well, we were trying to catch him making mistakes. He was a mathematician and he seemed like sometimes not coming prepared to the lectures, but that kind of added to interest to the, the whole whole kind of process and I know other people who are really really good lecturers and they all prepared but then their students read only their lecture notes and uh, they were not so much interested in the subject uh, so having some mistakes it's kind of add life I think to to lectures and to the books as well so we will consider actually some of the mistakes I found in this book but uh, if you have this one you don't need to switch to the to the quantum chemistry spectroscopy book. Uh, also, this one uh, by um, Macquarie, right? Quantum chemistry. So this this is a good book. Uh, it's a kind of old school black and white pictures and uh, lots of equations, lots of problems. Uh, these two books are on the reserve uh, library, so you can you can check them out. And uh, yeah. Use it. Also, I'll be posting lecture notes, and you will see that my lecture notes are quite different from any of those books. But they probably, yeah, well, kind of, they are superposition of these two. And uh, <coughs> I'll try to summarize things in a somewhat shorter version. So these are books for this course. Now, marking scheme is 20% homeworks, 30 midterm exam and 35, 35 final exam and labs 15%. To pass this course, you need to pass either midterm or final. That means you need to get more than 50% on one of those and to receive a final grade of 50 plus, which is, I'm pretty sure, similar to other courses you taken. Now, all exams will be last, uh, will last two hours and will allow uh, uh, cheat sheet, uh, double-sided, one page, right? Uh, and then problems will not be more difficult than homework assignments. So please try to solve homework assignments. Uh, they will be given quite regularly, almost every week, starting next week. Usually they will be given on Wednesday and due next Wednesday, okay? And there will be uh, already created a Dropbox in uh, EV building, the new building. Uh, very close to this one and uh, on the second floor uh, there will be Dropbox for this class and you just uh, need to drop your homework in that Dropbox before coming to the lecture on Wednesday or you can bring it to the lecture and give it to me it's up to you okay and then you can solve of course homeworks uh, together like discussing but try of course to understand uh, and try to work on your own. Uh, so we we have uh, all this uh, plug like we uh, we do not allow plagiarism in this course, and uh, all these uh, things are stated in a more extended version of syllabus. You can you can look it up. Uh, our stand on academic integrity and uh, other things. But uh, I encourage you to still work in the groups and uh, just present your work individually, of course without copying from someone else. Now, the TA for homeworks will be Margarita Gladkich. Uh, your, her email is uh, in, the, in the syllabus. You can look it up. And any problems you have with her grading, she will be grading your uh, homeworks. I'll be grading exams. And any questions about the grading, uh, you just direct to her. And if there will be some problems, uh, if you still disagree with her 
way of grading, then you can write to me, okay? But first, try to resolve the issue with her about the homework grades. Now, labs will be, as I was already saying, uh, next part, uh, in the second part, after the reading week, and they will be in BV 498. So this TA, uh, Rami Herib, will be giving a pre-lab talks and will help you to go over the problems. He also will be grading lab work. So again, uh, if you have any issue with his grading, uh, contact him, his email again on syllabus. And uh, if you have problem, like unresolved problem with him, then you can, you're free to, of course, contact me. Now emails, please write from UFT accounts because well, everyone has uh, filters these days and uh, please use professional language. Be sure to include the course code as a part of the subject line and sign an email with your first and last name as well as your well, student ID that just came out of the, uh, like it probably was copied from someone else's syllabus. I don't well, worry so much about uh, having a student, your student ID in the email, but just put your first name and last name, that's, that's important. And so here's an example, how do you write to a professor? You can, this, this is my name here. But uh, in case you are hesitating, just always follow the most formal kind of way of writing. So it starts with dear, then the title, and then the last name, comma, clear description of the problem, best regards, or something like that, comma, your name, first and last. And then email to TA, the same thing, just put a different name, dear Miss Gladkich, the description of the problem, best regards, your name, okay? So these are the templates. Any questions? All right, so if you have any, now you know how to write to me and TAs. Okay. Um, you want to get a textbook, mm -hmm. Uh, that I'm not aware of. Uh, you can you can check, and uh, but they these days you can order from Amazon. Pretty, yeah, right. And again, they are on a reserve in the library, so you can yeah, simply go to library and uh, yeah read it. It's yeah. We'll try to go relatively slowly, so your reading will not be extensive like it's couple of pages. Also, I encourage you to read up. If you have a book, uh, read up up front. And so come to the lectures with some preparation. I'll try to post the uh, lecture notes even maybe before the lecture at uh, reading in the book and seeing what, what is coming up and uh, trying to you know, figure out what is this all about. That's, that's going to be usually helpful. Yeah. So you wrote the second edition of Angle and Read? Yeah. No, no, no. It's, uh, second edition, is, I think, is the uh, the one that was available when this course started. So that's why it's propagated in all syllabus, but uh, syllabi, and uh, but you can you can use any edition. Yeah. The editions probably uh, don't have much of the difference. Uh, say, if we compare the difference between. Uh, these books and my lecture notes, there will be still more differences between those two sources rather than between editions, okay? All right, any more questions? All right, you, you will have plenty of opportunities later. Now, I would like to start the the scientific part, more scientific, more formal part. And uh, as I was saying, quantum mechanics originated from trying to explain few experiments that people in the beginning of 20th century uh, were aware of. So, and some of these experiments you, you will see in these books that um, uh, there are like five, six experiments, uh, usually people put in any book on quantum mechanics. And uh, the difficulty is that some of these experiments do not make any sense to a chemist, really. Like, uh, like they start talking about black body radiation, but for chemists it's just 
like not not something that they are usually thinking about, right? So, but historically, that's where it all started. Planck, for example, he he was thinking about black body radiation, and that's a radiation of, as you can imagine, you know, this thin idealized system that physicists call black body, and I'm only bringing this up by, uh, for saying that I'm not going to go into, like, historically in, the, in the, all these experiments. You can read them about, about them in the book, and I'm pretty sure they will not make much sense to you. Uh, you can try. Especially black body, for example. It's, it's the, difficult, the main difficulty with these experiments is that they are pretty advanced in order to understand why classical mechanics breaks down for them, you need to be quite uh, good at classical physics. And you're a chemist, so you're not usually good at physics in general, right? So that's why there is no point of going into these things. Like, uh, for example, we will consider atom because it's, uh, it's something that uh, well, we chemists care about, atoms, because molecules are made of atoms, right? But in order to understand from the classical perspective why electrons, when they move around the nucleus, why do they, uh, well, they accelerate their charged particles, and that's why, according to the classical electromagnetic theory, they need to irradiate light and then eventually fall on the nucleus. For that, you just don't have enough classical physics. So we'll just state that and we'll move on, right? So, Long story short, I will tell you relatively shortly about three experiments that are quite visual and simple in order to motivate quantum mechanics. And uh, they are not going to be given in the historical progression. And uh, usually historical way of exposing material is pretty confusing. Try to read, for example, any work of uh, Laplace or any work of Newton on derivatives. That's just horrible. Like you won't be able to understand what they're talking about, uh, because his, what, whatever they, like when they were inventing all these things, they they used completely different language that uh, compared to what we do, and uh, that's why I'll try to present these experiments in a more refined way, uh, with the fewer details. All right, so that's a double slit experiment, photoelectric effect, and uh, we'll consider hydrogen spectrum or that problem why in hydrogen electron, even though it's negative, doesn't fall on the positively charged nucleus. Now let's start with a double slit experiment. And I found that in these days of YouTube, there are nice YouTube videos on the double slit experiment. So I will watch that with you, and then we will discuss more in details. Oops, no sound so far. Just uh, bear with me. Hmm. Essentially, this guy is saying you know, some fluff about the quantum mechanics, and um, ah, okay. If we randomly shoot okay. A marble in a whole quantum weirdness. Here we are, the granddaddies of all quantum weirdness. The infamous double slit experiment. To understand this experiment, we first need to see how particles or little balls of matter catch. If we randomly shoot a small object, say a marble, at the screen, we see a pattern on the back wall where they went through the slit and hit. Now, if we add a second slit, we would expect to see a second band duplicated to the right. Now, let's look at waves. So, so far he's starting to uh, classical objects like marbles, right? And he shows you something that you would expect to see, right? First with marbles, two slits, two bands. And now with waves, uh, 
and then we will move on. Uh, he will move on to the quantum particles electrons. So just uh, bear with him. Hit the slip and radiate out, striking the back wall with the most intensity directly in line with the slip. The line of brightness on the back screen shows that intensity. This is similar to the line the marbles make. But when we add the second slip, something different happens. If the top of one wave meets the bottom of another wave, they cancel each other out. So now there is an interference pattern on the back wall. Places where the two tops meet are the highest intensity, the bright lines, where they cancel, there is nothing. So, when we throw things, that is, matter, through two slits, we get this, two bands of hits. And with waves, we get an interference pattern of many bands. Good, so far. Now, let's go quite a second. An electron is a tiny, tiny bit of matter. Like a tiny marble. Let's fire a screen through one slip. It behaves just like the marble. A single band. So, if we shoot these tiny bits through two slits, we should get, like the marble, two bands. What? An interference pass! We fired electrons, tiny bits of matter through. But we get a pattern like waves, not like little marbles. How? How could pieces of matter create an interference pattern like a wave? It doesn't make sense. But physicists are clever. They thought maybe those little balls are bouncing off each other and creating that pattern. So. Yeah, so that's, that's kind of important. That in the first uh, double slit experiment historically made, it actually was in 1961, uh, they, just, uh, they just shoot a bunch of particles. And then it's not that surprising because if you think about water, like he showed in the beginning, right? So water is like a classical liquid. And the reason we have waves, because we know water is made of a bunch of water molecules, right? And some of them can go up, some of them can go down. That's, that's, the, that's the origin of waves. And the same with the electrons. If you shoot many of them, the fact that they behave like a liquid is not so surprising because there are many of them. Some of them can go one way or another way. They, they can interfere with each other in the way the so I just liquid interfere, the, the, the parts of liquid interfere with each other to create waves. So it's not that surprising after all that, uh, well, it is surprising, but it's not as surprising as it will get right now. Like they, when, when they start shooting the individual electrons. After shooting electrons through one at a time, there is no way they can interfere with each other. But after an hour of this, the same interference pattern is seen to emerge. The conclusion is inescapable. The single electron leaves as a particle, becomes a wave of potentials, goes through both slits, and interferes with itself to hit the wall like a particle. But mathematically, it's even stranger. It goes through both slits, and it goes through another. And it goes through just one, and it goes through just another. All of these possibilities are in superposition with each other. But physicists were completely baffled by this. So they decided to peek and see which slit it actually goes through. They put a measuring device by one slit to see which one it went through and let it fly. <laughs> but the quantum world is far more mysterious than they could have imagined. When they observed the electron went back to behaving like a little marble. It produced a pattern of two bands, not an interference pattern of many. The very act of measuring or observing which slit it went through meant it only went through one, not both. 
the electron decided to act differently, as though it was aware it was being watched. And it was here that physicists stepped forever into the strange never world of quantum events. What is matter? Marbles or waves? And waves of what? And what does an observer have to do with any of this? The observer collapsed the wave function simply by observing. Yeah, so that's, that's a little bit uh, more advanced. Uh, so I don't want to talk about it right now. But uh, the, the main point here is that that the electron behaves like a, like a wave itself, and they, it, it can interfere with itself. That, that was kind of surprising, and you already probably know where I'm going with this. You, you probably heard about this duality, even in high school, of electron, right? So it's a particle and a wave at the same time. So how that can happen, or how that can be uh, understood? And we will understand that with the power of uh, essentially math. We will write down the Schrodinger equation, and uh, the Schrodinger equation will have all these properties, uh, essentially, right? And then, <coughs> any questions so far? Okay, so. Well, electron has a charge, right? You can measure a charge. Right? That's that's the way you can, and we know what the elementary charge of the electron is. So you can practically observe that. Uh, yeah, there's only one charge left, and uh, but how do you measure? There is a there is a screen with a I think it's a, a phosphorus screen, uh, screen which is uh, covered by phosphorus, and uh, when electron arrives, it uh, creates the, uh, well, kind of electri electric dis discharge, essentially. That is, again, um, measured. measured, yes. And so it's uh, electrons also focused with the uh, optical, uh, well, sorry, electrical lenses uh, that uh, essentially convolute all this, all this beam of electrons into, into this, uh, something that can hit, the, can hit this two slits which are close to each other. And uh, if you think about it, like, in order to make sense of all this stuff, you, you can start thinking about just the uh, regular events in your life. Like imagine like this room, for example, it has two windows and it's like two slits and the particles, not electrons, but the particles of light uh, come in. We know that there are, there are such particles, photons, right? And these particles, some, someone can say, okay, well, I open one window, we know what will be the result. This, if we shut down the light, uh, then this room will be lighter, right? And then following this double slit analogy applied to these two windows, you may think, okay, if I open now the second window, it's a second slit, right? So in the room, there should be areas where things become lighter and there are areas where things become darker, right? But we don't see that, why? Well, yes, but uh, but why? Why is that? Why is that happening? Right. So that's that's kind of still a puzzling question. And the answer to that, if you think about, it, is just that yes, interference still can happen. But as this gentleman pointed out, that we do not perceive it. And the reason for that is simply that the interference pattern the regions of light and dark, dark regions, they can be separated with a, such a small distance, say one angstrom, that we cannot perceive it. So overall we see some kind of average picture where everything becomes lighter. So it's not always we can see this interference uh, because simply physically we cannot perceive sometimes these uh, differences between maxima and minima. But interference is there because the particles that are entering through slits are quantum particles and they can interfere. So that's, uh, that's the double slit experiment. And 
I guess one point which uh, hasn't been mentioned here or was somewhat uh, vague, uh, vaguely mentioned is that why do we think that electrons are particles? Actually, on that uh, screen to which the electrons were shoot through double slit, what was found is that the place where electron lands is just one small, like a relatively tiny area that is smaller than the wavelength that you can imagine, uh, well, the electron should have for the diffraction to appear, right? So we know from the optics there are relations that uh, essentially the slits must be of a certain size, the distance between must be of a certain size so that certain uh, wavelengths will interfere. But the, but the area where every electron kind of landed, it, it was like light, a uh, lighten up area on that screen and that area was relatively small like a particle landed on it. Okay. Also, we can measure the momentum that the particle gives to the to the screen, right? It uh, it kind of hits the screen in a certain in a certain region, and there is a certain force exerted, like a particle's hit it. Yeah. Yes, uh, because the molecules of air would interfere and uh, will create the picture much. Uh, well, will be. <laughs> you won't even be able to see the interference because there will be so many other uh, objects like electrons in the uh, molecules of air. Air has oxygen, nitrogen, and other things. And just to conclude this, interestingly, this double slit experiment was first proposed as a thought experiment by Richard Feynman in, uh, in his book on, uh, it's a pretty, pretty good book uh, on a f kind of Lectures on Physics, uh, I think, uh, by Feynman. And the, the book was published in 1965. Right? So it's not the first thing that people have done to discover quantum mechanics. But it is a very nice experiment to show like, uh, this particle wave duality. And then in 1961, uh, in Germany, people first uh, did the, even before Feynman, they, they did this double slit experiment, but they didn't, uh, they didn't shoot individual electrons because it's, you can imagine it's much harder to shoot individual electrons. 1974, they shoot a single electrons and uh, they, they kind of confirmed the duality, but they didn't use actual double slit, they used some, some, some kind of biprism, which I have no idea what, what that exactly is, but essentially they didn't use bi uh, the, the double slit. And only in 2008, the Italian group made the actual double slit experiment. So the thought experiment was well, suggested by Feynman and then experimentalists start trying to illustrate it. Uh, and uh, that's one of the kind of the greatest experiments uh, that illustrates quantum mechanics. And of course, classical physics here represented as uh, marbles or liquid, right? So in the case of liquid, you cannot shoot uh, each particle of liquid, it's, it's always kind of liquid. And in marbles, you cannot have interference pattern. Right. So that's pretty much all about double slit. And the next experiment that was um, explained by Einstein is for the electric experiment, for the electric effect. And uh, before showing the simulations, I guess I'll let, let me quickly summarize what the experiment is. So if you have, uh, say, metal slab, and you shine the light, right, then electrons come out. So that's kind of the nature of the experiment. You shine the light, you get electrons out. And in classical physics, classical physics, energy of light was considered to be proportional to the amplitude squared, which is intensity of light. So in classical physics, light was considered as waves and electromagnetic waves. People, of course, knew about electromagnetism because Maxwell was uh, long before uh, this, all these photoelectric experiments. And Maxwell already stated that the uh, electromagnetic field 
which depends on time. That's that's what light is, and it simply can be put as a as electromagnetic field uh, proportional to amplitude times some oscillating function. There's a frequency of oscillations and amplitude of oscillation. So that looks like if we plot versus time our E, which is electromagnetic field. So then it's kind of oscillating function with uh, A as an amplitude. And here is a minus A. It goes up and down. And then the distance now between the in the maxima is like corresponding to one over frequency, right? So that's the classical picture. And the higher the amplitude, the more light you shine, right? Then more electrons are supposed to get out because electrons are attached to the metal. We know that kind of. And uh, but it turns out that. It's not only about intensity. People found that electrons do not come out if you don't have the right frequency of light. And mu here is a normal frequency, which is the omega that is in the cosine divided by 2 pi. Right? So there is a 2 pi coefficient between the normal frequency that uh, kind of we uh, usually measure in 1 over seconds, and the uh, angular frequency that we have in this equation. This is not important. right? So the, if we measure the kinetic energy of electrons that are coming out, then the profile is like this. So nothing up to a certain frequency, critical frequency, nothing comes out. And then we increase frequency, and things start to come out uh, in accordance with the energy conservation like uh, it's it almost was like the frequency is responsible for the energy so this classical picture was not correct because the energy of the in the classical picture only was corresponding to the amplitude but it turned out that actually the kinetic energy of electrons that they acquire from light uh, is proportional to the frequency. And Einstein was the first who figured out that actually what we need to think about light is that energy of light is equal to some constant multiplied by a frequency. And this constant has a name, Planck constant. And h is equal to 6 times 6, 10 to the minus 34 joules per second, uh, joules times second. OK, we will, it's not essential, this value, but it's a relatively small number. That's the kind of main message here. And this picture can be now put in the frame of the what's going on in the in the quantum uh, in the quantum context all our electrons they are sitting in the metal and they have they attach to the nuclear cores of the metal so there is some energy you need to give these electrons to overcome potential barrier for electrons to come out of the metal and that energy is called work function phi so when light comes it provides some energy, and then the kinetic energy of electrons that are coming out in accordance with the conservation of energy law, then work function plus kinetic energy of electrons is equal to the, uh, to the energy of light. So this is light, and this, is this, this energy is split essentially to overcome the potential energy of electrons in the in the metal, plus kinetic energy uh, that will appear here as an, uh, as an output, right? And so then the kinetic energy equal to, based on this uh, 
h mu minus phi, right? So you can see here that if you have small frequency, so that the energy of light is smaller than the warp function, then the kinetic energy becomes negative. So there is no such thing as negative kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is always positive. The negative kinetic energy would just mean that electrons do not come out at all. So that's this region, right? And when the frequency of light is increased, then the kinetic energy becomes positive and electrons start to come out, right? So that's what was figured out by Einstein. Now, the simple analogy for this whole experiment would be if you imagine there is a heavy object, like a tank, for example, and light of lower frequency, it's like small kids that you send to carry this tank or piano. Let's, let's be kinder to kids. So let's say there is a piano and you, you want to carry it and uh, you can send very many small kids, they won't be able to carry piano, right? But if you increase the frequency, that could correspond in that analogy to the age of people you send, uh, then you start sending adults and then, well, they will, they will be already capable of uh, carrying piano, right? But the classical picture was showing that it's all about the number of people who you, uh, who you are sending. The Einstein figured out, no, it's not about the number of people you are sending, not about intensity of light. It's also about the, the frequency of light. And uh, that's kind of the analogy illustrating the point, yeah. Right, so the different metals, they have different work functions, okay? So for example, silver, silver has 4.6 electron volts, the units of energy, uh, for the work function. Or the, the, the metal that has the lowest work function is cesium, has 1.5, uh, 95, sorry, electron volts. So 1.95 electron volts, that means uh, essentially you can excite electrons out of cesium with a visible light, right? So all the visible light goes from approximately 1.5 electron volts, that would be a red region, to uh, three electron volts, which will be a blue region, okay? And cesium is kind of convenient uh, material to extract electrons. Uh, actually, in, uh, experiments like, not in, in double slit actually, they, they use in some, something else, but you potentially can use cesium cathode uh, to generate electrons for double slit experiment. By shining light on cesium, electrons come out of the cesium, you start accelerating them with electric field, and shoot them through the double slit, right? So that's one way to do double slit experiment. One source of electrons. Just take a metal, and of course, in the real life, you are not restricted to the visual, uh, visible light. You can use ultraviolet, and then you can use silver, say, a cathode, and kind of get the electrons out of silver or copper or some, something else, right? So, but the this work function is a, uh, is a character of the material, and different metals have different uh, work functions. Now, let me show you this relatively short YouTube video that illustrate the double, uh, not double slit, but photoelectric. A little different from the one sold by Harbor Science. I'm going to be using it to demonstrate the photoelectric effect, which is a modern physics concept now required to be taught by teachers of AP Physics and the Next Generation Science Standards. So basically, if, when you charge up an electroscope, it can detect static electric charge. It helps you scope it out. There you go. The more charge you put on it, the more deflection. In this case, I'm putting negative charge on it from this balloon. and I can discharge it just by touching it. Now, I can also discharge it with light. 
That's the photoelectric effect. The way you do it is take a piece of. So this device actually it is sensitive to extra electrons that are present uh, on the on the tip here, right? If you have extra electrons, then the, the arrow goes uh, from the vertical position to horizontal. And uh, he was given the extra electrons by, by the, from the static electricity, essentially, right? But now you could imagine if you shine light and get these extra electrons from the tip by essentially emitting these extra electrons, electrons right? So then the, the arrow being in the beginning like this will go back to the vertical position and he will now show that different lights can do the job and some of us uh, like ultraviolet will do the job like zinc and scrub it with some steel wool this gets the oxygen layer off zinc oxide is not zinc but zinc is zinc now we have zinc exposed to the light in the room but the light in the room is not energetic enough to get the electricity off the zinc. So when I charge it up, I need to find some very good source of light. For example, ultraviolet light. Now I have an ultraviolet lamp right here, which I'll point at the camera and turn on, but I would never do this with your regular eyes, because the uh, your regular eyes are, are going to be damaged easily by ultraviolet light. This is ultraviolet C, and that is the shortest wavelength of ultraviolet light that we usually use. There actually is a shorter wavelength called ultraviolet V for vacuum ultraviolet, but this one is uh, typical. Uh, in fact, this, uh, this lamp is sold as a germicidal lamp, as it kills germs, and specifically it destroys the DNA in the germs. Anyways, now that the scope is charged, I can discharge it with the ultraviolet light. I think that test came back positive. Now you might wonder, is it really the ultraviolet light that's doing it? In my Willemite demonstration, I showed that there are, there's a type of ultraviolet light that's blocked by glass, that's the short wave, which means that I can prove that it actually is the ultraviolet light if I use glass and prevent it from happening. First, I'll show that the device itself is not discharging it. Nope, nothing. Now I put the glass in front, and I shine it, and nothing happens. But when I remove the glass, it discharges right away. This proves that it's the ultraviolet light, the short wavelengths that are doing it. Short wavelengths of light have a power that long wavelengths don't. They're more energetic, higher in frequency, and they have the energy required to liberate the electrons from the zinc. Now, I said electrons. What if I charged it positive? In this case, I have a fun fly stick which doesn't produce negative charge, but positive charge. The balloon produces negative charge. When I put positive charge on the electroscope, it detects it just the same, but positive charge should not be able to be liberated by the photoelectric effect. Let's see. Come on. What's going on? Why isn't it working? Well, there's two reasons. One, the protons are stuck deep in the nucleus, and they can't be removed easily except by X-rays or gamma rays or radiation from the nucleus itself or neutrons penetrating the nucleus. Generally, you're not going to get the protons out of the nucleus. And they're also really small in there, so you're probably not going to hit them anyway. But second of all, the electrons do get knocked out. Actually, oh, yeah, right. So actually I didn't connect with Wi-Fi here. <laughs> Whatever you saw was the, the stuff that was already pre-downloaded. But you, you got the point, all right? So let's uh, see whether... Can we continue? Okay, I, I don't think that uh, there's a big need for the continuation. And uh, that's the photoelectric, uh, photoelectric uh, effect. Um, let me just pull up the screen.
All right, any questions so far? So we are moving on to hydrogen atom. That's the third last example. Hydrogen atom, we have a proton, the one that you cannot pull out, right, uh, in photoelectric exp uh, experiment. And then electron, and in a classical picture, if you have two bodies, they usually go around like a planet, a uh, star and a planet around it, right? And then in a classical world, we have Newton equation, F -A -M -A equals F, and the acceleration, because there is a Coulomb, char uh, Coulomb force, right? Elect positive and negative charges, they are attract to each other. So then acceleration is non-zero, the force is non-zero, and acceleration from the Newton equation is non-zero. And we know, we kind of know from the electrodynamics is that the moving charges uh, that are accelerated, they actually irradiate energy. And uh, that's the reason why classical mechanics essentially tells us that uh, irradiation of energy will happen, energy will take place. And since it's a finite system, closed system, if we don't have anything around, right, then, then the energy of electron will be drained and eventually it will fall on the nucleus. That's what classical result is. Yet hydrogen atom exists and, uh, well, in a, uh, in a, in a kind of in a space, uh, usually if you have hydrogen atom like here on Earth, then we have something else around and it will react. And, uh, but the same idea would be applicable to molecules as well because we have electrons and nuclei and molecules. And by the same logic, we would be seeing all the electrons collapse into the nuclei in the molecules. But that doesn't happen. So, and the molecules would collapse and the whole universe would collapse by like a domino effect. But that doesn't happen. And of course, the natural question is why? And the answer to that is, well, like classical mechanics doesn't explain uh, the existence of the molecules and atoms, uh, their stability. Quantum mechanics does. And uh, for that, we would need to now go to the more formal level. I won't explain this experiment right now. Well, not even experiment, but the fact. Uh, but in a few lectures, it will be kind of clear why quantum mechanics, what protects electron from falling on the nucleus. Okay, to understand that we need to, I guess, not to be completely mysterious, the idea here is the electron has a wave nature and it turns out, we'll see that mathematically, that if you start compressing the wave, it will have more and more energy, right? And so for electron to fall on the nucleus, that wave needs to be compressed. Because in reality, if I say the hydrogen atom has a size of CN tower, and then I ask you, okay, in that scale, what would be the size of the nucleus? What would be your answer? If, say, imagine the hydrogen atom, which is an one angstrom, roughly, and that one angstrom we make, uh, well, correspondence to the, like, a size of CN tower, which is like 500 meters or so, right? So then, if we consider atom as a CN tower, what would be the size of the nucleus in the same scale? Like any guess. Of course, I'm not expecting you to answer that question absolutely correctly, but just out of curiosity, what's your, what's your feeling in that scale? What would be the size of the nucleus? Of course, it will be smaller, right? But is it the size of a car? Is it the size of the house? Is it the size of a... 1%. 1%. So that would correspond to five meters, uh, or even 50 meters, right? If it's like roughly 500 meters is a CN tower, which is probably our estimation, but uh, yeah, 50 meters, who, who else? Like, like this? Actually, the, the correct answer is it's gonna be a size of blueberry, right? So now you can, you can sense like how small the actual nucleus is 
compared to the whole atom. Atom is like of this fuzzy ball, right? And if that fuzzy ball weeks kind of scale up to the size of the CN tower, even then the size of the nucleus will be just uh, just a blueberry. Yeah. No, just there. It's just there, yeah. So that's the, the movement itself is a very interesting concept. We will talk about this. But uh, the movement is something that uh, really, it's, it's a very confusing concept when we go to the quantum mechanics. And what adds to the confusion that people try to explain, what, whatever, whatever quantum mechanics gives them as a result, they try to explain it in the classical concepts. And if you start thinking about them classically, you will get to the contradictions. For example, in this case, if you think about electron as moving around, uh, you will get quickly into the contradiction that moving charged particles should emit energy. And uh, that doesn't happen. Why? Uh, well, that's because the explanation that electron is like something that is moving around uh, is not quite right in for the hydrogen atom. Uh, my <laughs> Kind of, I was in the tenth grade or eleventh grade, uh, and a friend of mine asked, "Okay, so how do you like? We, we, you know, we have these p orbitals, right? And it turns out like these these are wave functions, and I will explain more formally what it is uh, in a moment, right? But it, and from the general chemistry, even you you heard that this wave function square is a probability to find probability density to find electron uh, in a certain region, and my friend was asking, okay, so if we have this p orbital and the, and the value of this function is exactly zero in the middle, how does the electron go from here to here? Right. So if if you like think about electron as a small birds that are flying around, right, and then you you say okay i know about this bird that it's flying like this but then the natural question comes okay if the probability to find that bird in the middle is zero and there is nothing well essentially this anywhere on this plane that cuts the the p orbital right in two pieces anywhere on this plane the probability is zero how does this bird <laughs> gets around from, from here, from the left to the right, and from the right to the left. How does it do it? And the answer is, it doesn't do it. It does just, the electron doesn't, is, is not representable as some flying object. Uh, because once you start thinking that way, you're thinking classically. You're thinking about birds that are flying. And of course, with birds, you always can locate, okay, birds is here, and the velocity is a vector going this way, and so you know what next time where the bird will be. Right? But with the quantum mechanics, it's not like that. That question is not uh, a valid question in quantum mechanics. You will get a random answer. And that's what Einstein wasn't happy about, that not all the, answer, all of the questions can be answered in quantum mechanics. That's one of the questions. Where is the electron right now? So we do the experiment. We find it here. Of course, we collapsed the system. We, we affected it while we were measuring. But say we made 100 p orbitals and 100 hydrogen atoms uh, put them in a p state and uh, made the 100 copies they are all identical in one we measure and we measure them exactly at the same time where is the electron now we start measuring them and it turns out in 50 systems we will get electron somewhere in the left hand side and in 50 systems it will be somewhere in the right hand side does that mean it's moving no because they were identical and we kind of measure them exactly at the same time and yet we got answers completely all over the place. And there is no way you can find it in the middle. <laughs> so that's why it's so weird and, and non-intuitive. But it's only because our intuition comes from, from observing birds and people who are running. And we know exactly if, if the person is running that way and he is right now here, the next moment he will be there, not there, right? So that's all that the real world kind of tells us uh, we, we, we learn from the real world and we don't observe electrons in the real life that's why all we, that's why it's so non-intuitive but yet it is the case all right so going back to the electron why doesn't it fall if it's a wave you really need to compress the wave a lot 
to make from one angstrom to 10 to the minus 5 uh, of angstrom. That's the compression you, you need to get in the situation where electrons falls on the nucleus. And when the wave is compressed, the energy goes up. It just will not happen because of that. And more formally, we, I will explain it in a, a little bit later, uh, because there is certain math. Right now, I'm throwing some words, and I don't expect you to understand this, just to give you a little bit of feeling what's going on. Okay? But math will clarify everything. Yeah. What they call the degeneracy pressure? Sorry? Mm -hmm. Is that what they call the degeneracy pressure? Degeneracy pressure? No, that's not what is degeneracy pressure, because I, I think that I'm not very familiar with that uh, concept, but I would expect uh, the generacy pressure is something probably related to the Pauli exclusion principle, where you cannot have the same electrons at the at the same state, and uh, yeah, they will always kind of repulse each other. They cannot be exactly degenerate in uh, in all quantum numbers, but uh, but no, that's that's not related to that. Uh, this is purely related to the fact that if electron is a, it has a wave nature, then the kinetic energy of electron, it's not really can be represent like cannot be represented as a kinetic energy of a particle anymore. It needs to be uh, considered differently, and we'll we'll get to the, like just in a few moments how how the how do we calculate the kinetic energy in the quantum world. Okay, it's it's different. It's it's essentially related to second derivative uh, of the wave function, and the second derivative of a wave of a, of any function actually grows when you start making function more uh, convex. Right, that's what happens when you comp kind of compactify object. You will always have uh, more compact and compact, and then the second derivative will grow up and up and up. And if the compression is too high, then it's just second derivative will be very high. Since you have a finite amount of energy in the system, it's just not energetically favorable to go to that configuration where electron is falling on the nucleus. Okay. All right. So let let me just start the Schrodinger equation uh, topic, and then probably we'll uh, we'll need to finish relatively soon. Now. <coughs> all this kind of motivated people to think differently. Uh, that. Essentially, that a Newton equation is not enough, and electromagnetic field theory, which is yeah represented by say here by this equation, it's just not enough. Classical physics is not enough to describe some of these uh, experiments or observations, and uh, then Erwin Schrödinger, which already was mentioned. Uh, Right, uh, so he came up with Newton-like equation, but of course it's very different. It's only Newton-like that, uh, in the sense that it allows to describe quantum objects, and uh, he came up with two equations: time-dependent and time-independent. And I will explain the relation between them. But first, let me write down for the simple one-dimensional particle what the most general time-dependent Schrodinger equation is right. All right. So equation. You, you're familiar with differential equations, right? Uh, are you? OK. You're familiar with differential equations. Differential equations, essentially equations where the solution is a function. right? Now, this is time-dependent Schrodinger equation, which is a differential equation. And the solution of this equation is a function, psi, psi x t. Here we consider a one-dimensional case where we say uh, it's like we have a par quantum particle, electron say, and it moves only along one dimension. Cannot kind of explore like y and z. We kind of confine things to, this, to just one dimension. For simplicity, of course, and uh, 
I will show you in the future how to extend this to three dimensions, how to extend it to more than three dimensions, because we will need that if we want to go to the molecules, right? But so right now, let's just uh, focus on one dimension. It's like a one-dimensional particle, almost like in a classical case, if I say I drop something, there is one dimension uh, along which uh, the particle will move, right? So if I drop the ball, then the, the height is that one dimension that along which the, the the ball will, move, will be moving with, according to the Newton equation. And I can solve exactly if, you, if the ball starts here, where will it end up in a certain time. Right? So this is a, si a same kind of uh, ideal here, but what we're looking for is not like in the, in the situation of the ball, just to, to give you a proper analogy. So that dimension x will be, say, going down from zero position and uh, the position of the ball is x function of time right so that's the function that we actually look in for in the uh, Newton equation and what Newton equation tells us is the mass of the particle if we take the second derivative of x as a function of t so that's acceleration Right, equals two, and then minus uh, we have force as a derivative of the potential energy. Right, so that's a uh, derivative of the potential energy written at the at the current position of uh, where the particle is. This this derivative needs to be taken at the at the position where the particle is, and this Newton equation can be solved if you know what the x was at the at a certain time, let's say at zero time, let's say it was at zero, and what was the original velocity dx over dt at that time, say it also was zero. Then with these two conditions you can find, solving this second order differential equation, what is x as a function of t. So you will know where the ball will be at the later times, say 5 seconds or 10 seconds, where it will be. Right? So that's the classical analogy. In the quantum world, we, we need to deal with the wave function, psi. And that's the quantity that will, describes, will describe the, the electron. Say we're talking about electron. And uh, this wave function is a solution. I will tell you what's the meaning of that wave function. Right now, it's just a math. I'm just, I'm just giving you what, what, uh, what Irwin Schoeninger came up with uh, to describe nature. Uh, that's the equation. And there are left-hand side and right-hand side for this equation. Right-hand side is pretty simple because it's the time derivative of this function. It's like time derivative here, Newton equation. Just here it, a, it was a second derivative. Here it was a, it's a first derivative, right? So don't mind the difference so much. That's mathematically clear what, what this object is. Uh, and it's partial derivative because, well, the function depends on two variables, x and t. x is a space variable and t is a, is a time variable. Now here i is a complex uh, unit, like everyone, the, does everyone know what the complex uh, numbers are, right? So you have i squared, it's minus 1. So that's the definition what i is. And we will not go too much into the complex variables. All we will need to know, and I will do a little quiz later, uh, kind of going with you on the basic uh, operations that we will need. The main one, actually, will, what we will need is that if we have exponent of i x, then the conjugation of this thing will be exponent of minus i x. The conjugation is one uh, operation that you you always do with the, and it will be very useful for the quantum mechanics, and that uh, that you just change the sign in front of i. So we won't go into the complex uh, variable analysis or calculus, but all we, we do with i is just a, some kind of a bookkeeping variable 
and uh, be sure that uh, well, we know how to square i or how to add and subtract quantum, uh, complex numbers. Right? So i is clear thing. h bar is just a constant. h bar is that Planck constant divided by 2 pi. So nothing really important at this point. It's just uh, some constant divided by another constant, 2 pi. So the right hand side is very simple. Uh, it's just a bunch of constants in this first derivative of time. But you can see now that uh, this right hand side defines how, the, how our object of interest, wave function, uh, how, does it, how, does it, uh, how does it defines the time derivative for that uh, function. Now the left hand side is more uh, kind of physical, more, it has more substance. Because this H is the Hamiltonian operator. And uh, we'll be dealing a lot with the operators. Operators is just a fancy way of uh, essentially calling that uh, we're going to operate on the wave function. That's just a quantum language, uh, essentially. And what this means is that if I do H psi, H contains two parts. This will be kinetic energy part. I will explain later why is it kinetic energy. And this is potential energy part. And it turns out that this energy operator, Hamiltonian, uh, it just consists of kinetic and uh, potential energy, but they both are operators. What does that mean? That means when operator, it operates on the function. And these are, again, constants, h bar square. It's uh, our h bar constant that, one constant that we saw in the uh, electro, uh, photoelectric effect, right? Divided by 2m, where m is the mass of the particle. And here we need to differentiate wave function with respect to the spatial coordinate x because our wave function depends both on the time and space coordinate. Right? So this first kinetic energy part is just a derivative with respect to space part. And uh, it, it operates on the function, it differentiates it. Plus, there is a potential energy part that can depend, again, on space and time. And that thing multiplies just x and t. So that's what h psi is. Okay? It's a relatively straightforward application of com or like a very well-known math. You just differentiate with respect to space twice and uh, multiply by the potential. And so what's the, that's what h is. Now you can see that the left-hand side of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation, what it does, it, it does something, it, it's related to space mainly because it's, uh, it has a differentiation with respect to space variables, x, and also potential energy. And potential energy we all know depending on uh, what, what kind of, what is the potential energy of the particle? What's landscape, essentially, right? If we put the particle on the inclined surface, then potential energy of the particle will have a dependence on x, linear dependence on x, essentially, right? So that left-hand side then describes how our spatial part of the wave function behave. And the right-hand side defines how the time dependence is in the wave function. Now, that's why it's so non-trivial to come up with such equation where you relate the space behavior with the time behavior. And that's the genius of the Erwin Schoeninger who came up with that. And there is no really derivation of this equation. There is just uh, the way it was derived, he kind of, uh, kind of made some plausible suggestions. And uh, of course, he knew much more than we. Uh, classical mechanics, and by analogy, he kind of suggested something, played a little bit with equations, and came up with this equation that uh, described the experiment, right? And so there were many attempts to, well, check this, uh, check this uh, equation, right? Solve it for real systems and compare the results of the, well, coming from the solution and coming from the experiment. And it wasn't found 
in any case that uh, the equation was wrong. So that's why people believe that it's right, right? So, <laughs> and it's like, like that always in science. Uh, the, the discoveries are not always made logically. They are made just by guessing and seeing that, okay, the guess actually doesn't contradict to any experiment that we have. And that guess provides provides uh, more information than, of course, individual experiments. Because now we know the equation, we can solve it for different systems, and uh, we can, first of all, build this Hamiltonian for different systems and solve this differential equation for different systems and then get more information about different quantum systems. So that's the kind of the main idea. Now, what is this wave function thing? Well, the wave function is the analog of this position that we had before. Uh, in, the in the classical mechanics, or in classical physics, we have all this, like even big bodies, we can chop them to the small particles, and small particles can be considered almost like a, uh, like, uh, that they, they don't have any size, right? So they have, uh, this is just, uh, just one point. And then one point has a dependence on time, where is it in space? Now quantum object, that, that uh, particle wave duality we were talking before, is described by the wave function. The wave function now is this fuzzy object, right? It, it has a space dependence and it also has a time dependence. So if we start so with something at the zero time, Uh, then at later time, like the ball actually moves here in this problem, this thing also moves in time and actually it can change its shape at later time, right? So it's a function, right? So it has a, it has a spatial dependence and at every time stamp, it has, uh, it can have potentially different space dependence, right? So it's this blob that changes its shape while it's moving, right? It's like a wave. A wave can change its shape while, when it's moving in time and it's evolving, right? So here I have time coordinate, here I have space coordinate. And the Z coordinate here will be well, value of the function, right? So it's a function of two variables, space and time. And here, the simplification is that we are dealing with one dimensional example, so we have only one space coordinate. If we consider real systems, say hydrogen atom, then, then we would need to have x, y, and z. And the things will become more and more difficult. And we will get to that, but later. Right now, this wave function, that's the main object that uh, is the is the outcome of solution our, of our, like this, the Schrodinger equation. And uh, it turns out the quantum mechanics, essentially if you, in quantum mechanics, if you know the wave function, you can obtain any property of the system. That's the beauty of it. Yes, the equation is difficult to solve. It's relatively easy to construct it. We, at the end of this course, you will be able to construct the Schrodinger equation for any molecule. That's the easy part. Even for protein, you can write what the Hamiltonian is. It's relatively straightforward to come up with it. Uh, solving is difficult, and that's why we will be solving it for only relatively simple systems. But once you solved it, this wave function gives you all the information that you could possibly uh, that you, you could possibly have and could answer all your questions. Now the caveat here, or the, <laughs> the trick here, is that some of the questions you will see, uh, even with knowledge of the wave function, will be answered not with certainty. So it's essentially, even knowing the wave function for some questions will give like 50-50%, uh, 50 chance of one outcome and 50 chance of another outcome. So that's, that's kind of a bad thing, but the good thing for you, once you know the wave function, potentially you can, you can obtain all the information that could possibly be obtained about uh, the system. 
It's like with the ball, we, if we know the x of t, the function, then we can predict where the ball will be in a certain time. You can give me any time, and if I know x of t as you, if you ever solve this problem, then it has the structure of this, right? Uh, dt plus, plus some constant uh, c, right? So it's a quadratic function of time in this problem. And of course, knowing these guys, you can, you can formulate what the, what this coefficients alpha v and c, c is zero because we start at zero. And so you, you tell me, okay, where the ball will be in five seconds, and I can put this five seconds here and they'll obtain where the ball will be in five seconds. The same here, if you will ask me, what's the energy of the particle? And I have a wave function, I'll teach you, and it's possible in quantum mechanics, to obtain the energy, to obtain the position, uh, like if you do the experiment, what will be the probability to find particle in a certain uh, in a certain position in space, and so on and so forth. So all, everything can be obtained from this wave function. That's kind of a magical object. And uh, that's why we'll be um, kind of looking, uh, looking at this object more in details. Now, <laughs> in a last few minutes, I'll start uh, kind of explaining a little bit about operators because we'll be dealing with the operators a lot. And uh, operators is like mathematical construction, mathematical notion. Uh, essentially operator, any operator, like we can write O with a hat, hat usually is put for the operators. Uh, any operator is a map between, between functions. So operator can be thought as an extension of what function is. Now, function, x squared, how would you explain what function is to, say, five-year-old, right? Or the ones, people who know only numbers. Well, function is something that accepts number and gives you back another number, right? Like x squared, it accepts, it's a function. It accepts, say, 2 and gives back 4, right? It's a map between numbers. It, you give one number, it gives you back another number. Operator is an extension that takes a function and gives you back another function, right? So function did that to numbers. Now operator does that to function. A uh, simple example of operator would be de de derivative, d over dx. So what this thing does, you give it x squared as a function, f, and it returns you 2x as another function, g, right? So operators, which we'll deal a lot with in quantum mechanics, it's the object that takes the function and gives you back another function. And the, this is the example of operator relatively complex operator where it has derivative, it has multiplication by another function, okay? But the, the idea is relatively simple. It takes a function and gives you back another function. And then we can, just to boost your confidence, let's consider another example. Operator 2 can be, say, d over dx plus d over dy, or dt, say. Because we spoke about time and space. This is operator 2. It's a sum of these derivatives. And uh, say it can act now on the function that has both x and t. Let's say x squared and the sine of t, right? This is our function of x and t. The same as like psi function that I introduced, right? So it's a f just a function of x and t. I just came up with it uh, on the spot. No physical, 
importance, just the function of two variables because my operator also acts on two variables, right? And the result will be uh, we act on this function with this guy and we add to that part the, this guy, right? So then it will be d over dx, x square sine of t plus d over dt, uh, x square sine of t, right? And then this we know already it's a 2x multiplied by sine t. Because t is not x, they're independent, and d over dx doesn't act on the sine of t. It leaves it as is. Now the same here with just t, not uh, d over dt, not acting on x. x square is, is there, intact. And then sine, when we differentiate sine, we get the cosine, right? And that's now our answer. This is our function g of xt. That this operator, when it when it's given the function x square sine of t, it gives you back function 2x sine t plus x square cosine t. Right? This is all just simple math, right? Well, relatively simple math. Now, why operators are so important? Why am I making this big deal? Well, first of all, they are in the in the Schoenger equation, which we will uh, be using a lot, and which is the basis of uh, quantum mechanics that we will be studying. And more than that, it turns out that operators is the important link between any experimentally measurable property and the wave function. So if you want, if you know the wave function, if you want to obtain any property, position, momentum, energy, there is always associated operator in quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanical framework sees the world that way. If you have a property, quantum mechanics has an operator that corresponds to that property. And through analyzing this operator, you will get to the prediction of the property. Okay? So operators give you the link between the wave function and the property that can be observed. That's why they are so important. That's why we'll be looking at them a lot in the next lectures, all right? Because now our time is up, okay? Any questions? Okay, good.